that's Tom, a famous experimental subject whom many of you know about already, busy and working as usual. He's a very remarkable fellow. Some 60 years ago, Tom had an accident which resulted in a large gastric fistula, thus transforming an ordinary youngster into an incomparably good experimental subject for the study of the stomach. As an adult, Tom's generosity and patience permitted some 15 years of experimental research, sometimes continuously for days on end, for months and months. I started this study in collaboration with another Dr. Wolf, Dr. Harold Wolf. This film is a record of our 15 years of investigation, which will account for some of the unevenness in color quality, and sometimes for the lack of dramatic continuity. The stomach's been called the seat of the soul, and we were able to observe extraordinary changes in Tom's stomach as he reacted to people and events in his daily life. By allowing us to work with him for such long and continuous periods, Tom got so used to the experimenting itself that the circumstances were not stressful and hence did not modify gastric function in any significant way. Tom? Tell me in your own words how you happened to get this opening into your stomach. Well, when I was a boy, about nine years old, I swallowed some scalding hot clam chowder. Clam chowder? What did you think it was, Tom? Well, the way the can felt, I thought it was beer. You thought it was beer? <laughs> well, what was... What was done? What happened? And I fell on the floor unconscious. And what happened then? After I come to, everybody was coming in trying to do something so I could swallow. But there was nothing anybody could do. So the doctors had to go to work and make an incision in my stomach and leave it that way so I could feed. And you were nine years old. How long ago was that, Tom? 1890. Five. And since that time you fed yourself? Oh, I have. Has it interfered with you, Tom? No, not in the least. Were you able to do sports as a youngster? Yes, play baseball, football. And then I went to work at all trades. And then I got married. I got a daughter. And a granddaughter. Could you work and support the family? Absolutely. That's wonderful, Tom. The record of his operation at the New York Hospital in 1895 shows that Tom went sour on the operating table, and that's why his fistula is so large and has to be covered by gauze pads and a bandage. For the experimenter, this is fortunate because Tom's fistula is unique since it gives an unimpeded view of a large section of the gastric mucosa. Here is a close-up of it, looking very healthy. By a slight increase in abdominal pressure, more of the membrane can be brought into view. When we hadn't seen Tom for several months, we discovered a lesion on his gastric mucosa, which grew with extraordinary rapidity. It turned out to be an adenocarcinoma. It was excised by the surgeon, and in the latest pictures of Tom, you can see the stay sutures still in place. This x-ray shows Tom's stomach. The fistula is located about two-thirds of the way between cardia and pylorus. Notice how the greater curvature is rotated forward. Two hours after the barium meal, the stomach is emptied normally, and most of the barium is in the intestine. The obstructed esophagus ends in a cul-de-sac. It holds about 100 cc's of liquid and must be emptied periodically. As Tom has told you himself, his handicap did not prevent him from supporting himself and his family. Tom was proud of his independence. In his youth, he even played football. Only feeding was a little complicated. Tom feeds himself through an ordinary
kitchen funnel inserted into the opening of his stomach. Funnel is connected with a rubber tube, which is notched at the end so that it can be inserted easily into the opening. Tom, would you put the tube into your stomach, please, to show us how you take your dinner? Once the tube has been inserted, Tom chews his food, pretty much the same sort of food you or I might eat, and then spits it directly into the funnel and into his stomach. We were naturally eager to learn as much as possible from the accessible stomach of Tom. First, we studied the appearance of the mucosa under all sorts of conditions, with the naked eye, the hand lens, and the dissecting microscope. Then we correlated these observations with measurements of secretion and motor activity. Next, we studied the mechanism protecting the stomach against the activity of its own digestive juices. And later on, we studied the effects of drugs in various phases of gastric activity. And finally, we obtained a running insight into the complex reactions of the stomach to various psychologically important events and stresses. Two characteristics of the mucosa can actually be seen to change, its color and its turgor. Color ranged from orange yellow to deep red. We discovered that the color could be evaluated accurately by comparing the mucosa to an ordinary Talquist hemoglobin scale. In this way, we could record the color of the mucosa at any moment as a number suitable for graphing. Obviously, color change depends on blood flow. With a specially designed thermocouple, we were able to show an exact correspondence between the amount of blood flowing through the mucosa and its color. For our work, therefore, the Talquist readings are sufficiently accurate, and the number represents a specified degree of hyperemia. The microscope gives us more detailed information about the morphophysiology and mucosal color changes. This is a photomicrograph of the living mucosa. It appears a little hazy because the picture is taken through a thick layer of surface mucus and the surface epithelial cells. Notice the small white regions, which look like jumbled Chinese characters. These are the glands of the mucosa. The red areas in between are the lakes of blood. When the mucosa is pale, the white areas predominate. When it is red, the blood lakes are more prominent. These conditions were illustrated very clearly in Maul's drawing. With hyperemia goes turgor. By counting the number of folds in the surface of the mucosa, we got a rough estimate of its turgidity. As the mucosa becomes hyperemic and edematous, neighboring folds merge until there are five or six large folds instead of the 19 or 20 seen in the pale inactive state. One of our most interesting findings concerns the fact that the turgid mucosa is extremely vulnerable. Just a slight touch with a glass rod causes petechial hemorrhages. Surprisingly, we found the turgid mucosa is sensitive to pain. While in its pale or average state, it may be pinched or cut without pain. Whenever we needed gastric juice for analysis, it was collected with an ordinary Chetwood syringe. Here, a sample is being tested for acidity with a pH indicator. Normal, healthy, tough skin is quickly digested by gastric juice. Our problem was to find out how the delicate cells of the gastric mucosa protect themselves against digestion by gastric juice. 
or from the corrosive action of other chemicals. The primary defense against digestion is provided by the thick layer of mucus, which covers the entire surface of the stomach. Its exact action is not understood. Partly it neutralizes and also insulates, but at the same time it must allow for secretion and absorption through it. We tested the reaction of the mucosa to strong acid, one normal hydrochloric, and to blistering mustard. We were unable to observe the slightest damage even under the microscope. Yet these same substances, and many others, painfully burn the skin. To further test the self-protective action of the stomach, we kept wiping away the mucus from one small area, allowing the gastric juice free access to the spot. Within three days, there developed a well-defined crater, which looked very much like a clinical peptic ulcer. We covered it with a protective petrolatum dressing and it healed completely within another four days. It's interesting to note that gastric acid secretion was increased spontaneously in the presence of the experimental ulcer. Another aspect of gastric function is motor activity. A balloon attached to a chymograph was easily inserted into Tom's stomach. Here you can see the chymograph needle in action, recording gastric movements. And these records show the normally active, the hypoactive, and the hyperactive states. These small waves are movements caused by breathing. Records such as these, combined with simultaneous inspection and chemical testing, have given us a fairly complete picture of gastric function. These combined records were used in a variety of ways. Here, for example, we see the effects of atropine. Within six minutes of the injection, the waves of contraction had stopped. And as you see, color faded and acid secretion decreased. Our most interesting studies involved the reaction of Tom's stomach to stress as it occurred naturally in his day-to-day -day life or in response to stressful interviews. By carefully directing the conversation, we could, without Tom's knowledge, produce almost any desired type of gastric reaction. Tom, when you left town, you had no idea that they had in mind some plan about retirement? No. Did anybody say anything to you, Tom? No. Well, what actually happened then after you left town? When the paymaster came to Oklahoma, that's the first sunshine that I saw. What was that? He gave me my last check. What? I didn't have to call for it. He sent it to you? He sent it to me. And you had no suspicion of this before? No, no. Did you speak to him about it? No. Suppose you had mentioned it to him. What would he you He lied. Say? As we began this interview, which was concerned with a very serious personal problem of Tom's, the membrane was of average color and turgor with several folds in view. After several minutes of discussion of his forced retirement, the membrane blushed and the folds thickened and merged. Motor activity was also increased. Here we can see the profound changes in Tom's stomach with various psychological states. Fear, relative serenity, and anger. When Tom reacted to a situation with feelings of dejection and despair, his stomach was pale and underactive. 
And sometimes this hypo-functioning state lasted for many days or weeks. But Tom, being an Irishman, responded to most of life's challenges with his fists up. Why was it that you had to look after these grandchildren, Tom? What happened? Well, we were determined to take them out of the home. And how did they happen to be in the home? The mother placed them there. Mm -hmm. And under these circumstances, his stomach became overactive. The membrane engorged with blood with increased production of acid and increased motor activity. And this hyperfunctioning state sometimes also lasted for periods of days or weeks. And this situation, of course, is more hazardous for the gastrointestinal tract because, as we pointed out, the membrane is more fragile and easily damaged when it's hyperactive. Now, other individuals might respond to the same type of situation in a fashion opposite from Tom, depending on how they interpreted the threat. When a person cannot interpret his surroundings, and the stomach, hence, cannot react to life stresses, there's only a basic rhythm of motility and secretory activity. This record, showing cyclic acid production, comes from a fistulous individual who, through an accident, was also physiologically decorticated. There's an additional and interesting observation I'd like to report. When Tom did not have the psychological satisfaction of enjoying his food, when food was placed directly into the funnel without being tasted, he lost weight. This implies that some aspects of metabolic balance are influenced by the meaning of life experiences. In appraising the results of these studies, the most important contribution was to add another element to Cannon's concept that emotional stress causes gastric hypofunction. Tom has taught us that not only hypofunction, but also the potentially more dangerous hyperfunction of the stomach may occur in reaction to stressful life experiences.